there, but I've taken it off. So it's, it was like blocking, it was throwing up a firewall for um, video chat. Yeah, we, we've just gone live. Um, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, yeah, no, thank you both so much for being here tonight. Um, tonight we are joined by Meredith Hall, the author of Beneficence, and Lily Brooks Dalton, the author of Good Morning Midnight. Meredith Hall's memoir, Without a Map, was instantly recognized as a classic of the genre and became a New York Times bestseller. It was named a Best Book of the Year by Kirkus and Book Sense and was an Elle Magazine Reader's Pick of the Year. Hall was a recipient of the 2004 Gift of Freedom Award from A Room of Her Own Foundation. Her work has appeared in Five Points, The Gettysburg Review, The Kenyon Review, The Southern Review, The New York Times, and many other publications. Hall divides her time between Maine and California. Lily Brooks Dalton's novel, Good Morning Midnight, has been translated into 17 languages and is the inspiration for the film adaptation, The Midnight Sky. Her memoir, Motorcycles I've Loved, was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award. She currently lives in Los Angeles. Uh, we're gonna be ending tonight's conversation with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions for Meredith or Lily, please drop them off in the YouTube chat box and I'll make sure they get asked. And before I turn the time over to the two of them, um, I would just like to give a shout out to our partner for this event. This event is part of the 24th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. This annual free festival is the Utah Humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. The complete program is available at utahhumanities.org. Our thanks to the book festival's major sponsors, George S. and Dolores Dorr Eccles Foundation, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Fund, Summit County RAP, Weber County Ramp, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the King's English Bookshop, Weller Book Works, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts and Catalyst. Um, and as our store is based in Utah and this event is being featured as part of the Utah Humanities Book Festival, we would also like to give a land acknowledgement. Weller Book Works is located on the Native American shared territory of the Goshute, Navajo, Paiute, Shoshone, and Ute people. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this land, and we honor and respect the indigenous people still connected to the land on which we gather. Um, and finally, um, to our audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, please consider supporting the authors by buying their books, and please consider supporting our bookstore by buying them through us. And I will leave links where you can do so in the chat box and the video description. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Meredith and Lily. Thank you both so much for being here. Thanks, Salem. Thank you, Salem. Meredith. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about beneficence. Thank um, you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just, it's such a gorgeous novel. And um, I got to read it a year ago and I it's been with me ever since. Um, so getting to have this conversation because we did an event before, but now this is our second go round. So I'm excited that we get to do this. Um, so I just want to like, do a little, little bit about what the book is about, if that's okay. Um, so this novel is about a family in rural Maine, working a dairy farm, appreciating the land and the work and each other until something really terrible um, and unexpected occurs. And their whole world is knocked off its axis and the sort of journey um, of, rebuilding after that event. Um, so I thought it might be good to start off just a little reading and then we can dive into some questions if that sounds okay. That sounds great. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> Beneficence is written in three voices. Um, this is a family. Uh, Top is the father, Doris is the mother, and there are three children, Sunny, uh, the oldest, Dodie, is a girl in the middle, and Bastin is the youngest child. And the book is broken into four sections. Um, we open at a time when this family is living very productively on this very, very beautiful uh, main dairy farm. And um, they 
the farm has been in Tupp's family for five generations and fell into some disrepair over, the, over time and Tupp and Doris have restored the farm to its productivity. And they are a family that not only works well together and there is a lot of daily work for them. It starts in the late 1940s, um, but they also love each other very much. They enjoy each other's company very much and really are a unit as they do this work. So the book opens there. A tragedy hits this family and does, uh, it shatters that, um, the grace of the life that they had been living. And the rest of the book follows this family as they struggle through their grief and their inability to find their way back to each other during those, that long, long period of grief. Um, and so it's told in three voices. Uh, Top has a voice, Doris has a voice, and Dodie, that middle child. So um, Dodie, I knew from the beginning, I thought that Top would tell this story. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll see what Doris has to say. Doris showed up as soon as I started writing. She was the first person to speak. And uh, then along the way, I thought, you know, Dodie, uh, maybe I could see if Dodie can contribute to this story. And it turns out that Dodie is an ex extraordinarily um, resourceful, strong, resilient child. And she has a lot to say about what's going on in this family. So she sort mm -hmm. of tells the story between her mother and her father. She tells a story that's separate from them. Um, the book opens with Doris's voice and then Dodie's and then Tops. It moves from the late 40s through until the early 1960s. And uh, it follows that pattern throughout the book. Doris, Dodie, Top, Doris, Dodie, Top speaking. So this is uh, early in, um, in the book. This is in, during that opening uh, section where this farm and this family are functioning very, very well. And this is in Doris's voice. These people, all of them are storytellers and they, they move back in time to memories and tell a lot of stories. They are great storytellers and they, um, their instinct is to tell stories. And here, Doris is thinking back to a story from when she was a young, young woman. Uh, so this would, this would actually be in, uh, she's speaking from the late 40s uh, with young children. Once, a year or so before I met Tup, my father and I closed the store as usual and walked home together for supper. But instead of turning in at our gate, he nudged my elbow and said, let's stay out a while longer. It's a nice night. It was nice, a cool late spring night, still lit pink in all the darkness. No stars were out yet, although it was clear. Colebrook was once a busy town with the mills working two shifts and men and women going to or from work at all hours. But then the depression ended all that. Those were hard years for everyone. I remember that night as a time of quiet with the mills closed down or on reduced shifts an absence of the old noise and hellos and good evenings on the sidewalks. The town was out of work and men and women sat on their doorsteps smoking cigarettes, nodding seriously as we passed while their children played in the side streets. My father was a silent man, a kind but formal man. We worked together every day in his store, Canton's Grocery, which he had built up enough that he was able to stay open through those hard times. He sold groceries and meat and was known as a good butcher. Women in the neighborhood came every day to buy their food from Jack Canton. He never said more to his customers than he did to me or to my mother, but people liked and trusted him. You could see that. I spent my whole childhood in that store. If I wasn't at school, I was there helping out. Sometimes my mother let me go off with a friend who stopped by and my father always nodded his yes. But I enjoyed being at the store and seldom asked to be allowed to go out. It was an old building my father owned outright long and narrow with a counter running almost the length. The meat counter was in the back. It was dark inside the store, warm in the winter and cool in the summer. The floor sloped to the back as if you were walking down a slight hill and then back up and they creaked in a comforting way. By the time I was in high school, I could have run the whole place myself. 
I knew the business end to end, the ordering and the stocking and how to display the produce and weigh and bag the dry goods, how to tally the receipts and put the cash in the safe for deposit at Gardner Savings each Friday night. I used to say to my father, I'd like to run the store after you get tired of it. But he would sort of shrug and say, I don't imagine the man you marry would agree to that. I felt a pang of fear when he said that, unable to picture my future or any of the mysteries it held for me. I must have been about 15 that night, he asked me to walk with him. I remember feeling scared. I had never known my father to deviate from his routine and I felt off balance. Even then, I did not like surprises. We walked elbow to elbow in silence up Jackson Street and across to Governor. Every house had its lights on by then and the families had all gone indoors for supper, whatever it might be in those times. My father was a generous man and did what he could to help his neighbors, extending credit for basic necessities that might never get paid for. But we were beyond our own little world by then, walking streets I had no reason to be on. My father seemed to have no purpose, no intention in where we walked. And although I was young, and although he said almost nothing, I felt a deep sense of dread as if he were opening a door onto possibilities that I must resist. And then I sensed that he was crying, silently, the way he did everything. I felt his grief, whatever it was, draw me to him like a gentle but insistent arm. He did not raise his hand to wipe his tears. They flowed down his narrow, tired face, dripping off his jaw and his chin. We walked from pool of light to pool of pale light, away from home. I had a great need to know what this terrible sadness was my father carried and a great need to never know its name, a sort of superstitious belief that if we did not speak its name out loud, it would never come to find me. I could not imagine what could cause my father such sorrow. Was it simply a loneliness from all that gentle silence? Did he wake up that morning unable to justify the path his small life had taken? But isn't every life small, I wondered, and a gift in its everyday inconsequence? Was this about love? I felt a stab. Did my father long for something more than my mother's steady and practical love? Had he glimpsed something in the store that day, a look or a laugh or a sigh, a small comment about how lovely the springtime air feels on your face, something that reminded him of another life he had once imagined, of something lost forever? Each possibility frightened me. Why did he need me to walk beside him while he let his swelling, this swelling current pass? Would I ever feel such an awful loneliness in my own life? He never changed his pace. When we got to the bottom of High Street, we turned together back toward home where my mother waited for her husband and her daughter. The porch light was on, an inquiry into where we had been. My father took out his handkerchief and blew his nose, folded it carefully, and nodded for me to go ahead of him through the door to our family supper. Thank you, Meredith. I loved that selection. Um, this is maybe a little bit of insider baseball, but I'm curious how you choose a section for an event like this. You know, I feel like we write the book and it starts here and it ends here, but like choosing a an excerpt is like finding another entry point for the, for the viewer, the reader. So how do you go about deciding where to read from? It is, and you want to tell enough of the story for people to be able to understand where we are and what we're doing, but not mm. so much of the story that they're, you know, that you're moving ahead too fast. And uh, mm -hmm. so I do think that it takes some care. I write very episodically, um, mm -hmm. both in my memoir and in this novel. <clears throat> there are double spaces on the page every two or three pages. So there is mm -hmm. something happens. There's an episode, there's a story. Somebody is thinking through something, that double space on the page and we're on to something else. And that actually does make it easier for me to find. I can, I can uh, pull out those two or three pages easily for reading. Uh, but they yeah. are, you know, a lot of it is that they are storytellers. I can open this book in most places and one of these yeah. three people are telling a story about something that happened maybe yesterday or last night or this morning or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years or 20 years before. Yeah, I love that. And I, it, um, the sort of the use of the, the return key, right? The, the line break, the, it, 
it's it's funny. I think it took me a while as a writer to feel ownership over that. Like I have the power to begin and end the scene yes. whenever I want. And I'm I'm curious if that is and and I remember this too from your obviously from beneficence, but from an essay you sent me a while back. It had that same rhythm to it and the same kind of negative space that allowed the reader to kind of pause with the moment and then move on to the next moment and I'm curious if that's always been part of your writing or yes. if that's come come more recently yes you know I I taught writing in the MFA program at the University of New Hampshire for years and years and uh I you know I I think that usually we start and <clears throat> excuse me an essay or a short story and it is it's complete it's cohesive and when I finally uh, started writing my own books um, and wrote my memoir it is it looks just the same on this page on the page this seems to be um, the way that I find to uh, tell stories and to be with characters as they move through their own thinking um, it's it's a very natural and intuitive way of writing for me mm. Mm. I love that I love that um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, you know, the last time we talked about Beneficence was a year ago. And so, and that was when the hardcover was launching. And so you've been kind of living with this book, but also introducing it to the world over this very strange year. Um, and I think, you know, the themes of the book certainly speak to a little bit of the collective struggle that we're, we're all, um, wrestling with right now this this sense of like how do we recover from the unthinkable um, and I'm curious how, if the story has kind of shifted for, or, or yeah if it, if it shifted for you over the past year if you've come to think of it in different ways given the moment we're in and given you know sharing it the way that you have been I think you know my sense of the book itself probably hasn't changed you know the paperback comes out uh, early, early this month, actually, we're in September now in just a couple of weeks on September 14th. And uh, so I've, I'm busy again presenting this book. I've been talking to a lot of people and I realize this, the, my, the book itself has not changed for me. Um, but I do, I have felt from the beginning with Beneficence that it is a story that is about loss and grief and sorrow and those, um, and the human uh, effort, the hard, hard work of coming to terms with great loss. And I do think these are, these are universal under any circumstances. Everybody, everybody, everybody yeah. loses something, yeah. somebody, right? We all know right. this. And um, I think that there is a poignancy now to this particular conversation about loss and grief. Um, and also about uh, what it is that uh, hauls us back to ourselves and back to our faith in something. How do we return to the faith that has been uh, shaken badly? And I think all of us are, are living in that time now. You know, what, what are we moving back toward and uh, what, is, what is the goodness that we um, can hold in our imagination and in our thinking? that will guide us through this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, th yeah, that makes total sense to me. For, for me, this book has been, it felt like kind of a lantern when I first read it in this like pitch black moment mm -hmm. um, for that very reason that it's like this sort of, um, you know, getting maybe not quite a roadmap because every, everyone's journey is different. And I think that's part of what the book is showing, but um, just this sort of, uh, thread of hope that we can hold on to, right? That like there is a process here. There is a process of recovery from unthinkable tragedy. Um, yeah. Did you guys? Well, I was just going to say, I think uh, by nature, I am an optimistic person and I, uh, these people live in a very beautiful place and the land itself is so sustaining to them, this land that has been worked by the center family for five generations. It is so sustaining. And the, the, the everyday grace of their family in that house and in the barn and in the garden and in, in the fields, this is, there is a grace that they share 
based on that work. And I think that that is really an expression of um, my own sense of how the world is. We're pressed very, very hard right now, but I do um, I, really hard. We have some very hard decisions to make and some very hard actions that we need to take. But I uh, seem to be built uh, optimistic and um, I don't think blindly so, but I believe, I believe in our desire, our hunger for um, goodness and for shared goodness and for purpose. And so I think for me, that is, you know, whether it is within this family's deeply private process of grieving or uh, for us out in the world, I think that it is, it's, it's all in the end, it's all the same longing that we have. Hmm, I love that. I mean, it, it makes me think about, you know, you mentioned the, the private process of their grief and, you know, I'm over here thinking about our collective experience that we're all suddenly in this, like in this together is like the, the feeling here. Um, but there is this kind of tension between what we can experience as a collective or as a group. And, and that I think goes for the center family too, right? Like they experience this loss as a family, but then um, they have to kind of follow their own yes. path in terms of, of coming back to it. And I think that's a part of, um, you know, just to, sorry to keep talking about the, <laughs> the pandemic, but I think that's another piece of, of this for, for all of us is that, you know, there is this sense of being connected in a, in a new way and an important way, but there's also this dire loneliness of there's only so much you can share. There's only so much of a singular burden that you can carry on collective shoulders. I, and I, so I, even, I don't know if there's no, a question in there. <laughs> that story, the, there is, there are millions of individual stories right now in the world with the suffering and uh, mm -hmm. in many cases, acute suffering. And yet it oddly, um, it's the same, it's one shared experience. It's a very, mm. very strange moment, you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. I'll keep stewing on that. Um, <laughs> so I also wanted to, I feel, I wanted to ask you about work because I think um, work is such an important theme in this book and the, the joy of working. And when I say work, I mean, physical labor, right? The, the physicality of running a dairy farm. But at the same time, there's so many other ways in which we work. You and I work at a desk, you know, creating stories. And, um, and then there's also this kind of emotional way in which the family has their work cut out for them in, you know, the latter half of the book um, in terms of, of processing and coming to terms and and, and I guess I just, I guess, the, I guess the question is, was that something you were thinking about while you were writing, putting these two kinds of work, the, the physical and the emotional side by side? Does that make sense? Yeah, actually, I'm not sure that I saw it that way, Lily. I think for me, the work on this farm that the family shares is a rhythm that is its own sort of cohesion. It is mm. that that daily work and seasonal work. It, they move from morning to night uh, and then season to season. And mm -hmm. it's, there is such powerful rhythm to it. It's, um, I've always enjoyed hard physical work. I raised my children with, um, we raised sheep and chickens and uh, had oh, yeah. you know, piles of uh, manure in the pasture and wheelbarrow going out every morning from the barn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I raised uh, almost all of our food in organic gardens. It was, and I loved that work. And uh, I, I like the work of the body. It's very, very familiar to me. And I think that I saw the work on the farm, not in any heroic sense. There's, you know, his, Tup's father did exactly the same work and he found nothing heroic about it at all. He mm. did not like it. He resented it. He was really broken by it. Um, but his wife had died and he was left with these several children 
and this farm to run during the depression. And it all really broke him. He made, he made his way through it, but with absolutely no sense of satisfaction. And then Tup came along. He had imagined that he was going to go out into the world and get a college, the, the college degree his father wanted him to get to spare this oldest son having to work on the farm. And then his father died suddenly and Tup returned from college. Uh, he had met Doris and married Doris. And um, he returned to the farm so ready to do that work. And they worked really, really hard. They had one and then a second and then a third child while they were bringing this farm back to its health. And Doris, as you heard in that reading, grew up in a, a town in Maine with her father running a store. She didn't know anything about farming. So she had a great deal to learn. And uh, I don't think that there is uh, necessarily a heroism to facing that work every morning. There was really a deep pleasure, a really profound satisfaction. And in the end, um, this emotional work that they needed to do after this awful event hit them, they really didn't do much work at all for a while, emotional work. Mm -hmm. They really yeah. just got knocked off their feet and barely coped. Um, and then slowly, 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 over a number of years, they managed to find their way back to themselves and to each other. I don't think that that work was, it has a kind of corollary in the physical work. I think that the physical work actually is what saved them. I think it got mm. them through those kind of numb periods when they just disappeared. Uh, it's a wonderful main expression uh, when something terrible happens, they'll say he or she went into herself or into himself. And mm. uh, that physical work was a requirement. Doris was not able, she, she maintained her kitchen. She kept cooking nice. food, but that was it. All of her other farm chores fell to top and the children and especially Dodie and um, they, but that work, that work had been the fiber and structure of their life and it didn't betray them. It was always there for them. And uh, for me, it was that, uh, that structure is kind of an armature of their life. And it was that armature of daily rhythm of work and seasonal rhythm of work that finally rescued them. Hmm. I love that. Well, it makes me think too of um, something that you and I have talked about in your in your teaching career. It, um, I remember you telling me about um, assigning so much work to your students and them elevating, you no, know, like really becoming so enthusiastic. And and as a teacher, also myself, I just like it's so visceral when you can feel a classroom coming together and just being excited about the material and the subject. And, yes. you know, I wonder, I wonder if there's a way in which the work, I don't even quite know how to say this, but, um, you know, we think of the work as, as, as like the path toward the product, you know, um, the outcome at the yes. end of the, the effort. Yes. Uh, and I wonder if there's a way in which both with the centers and the work on the farm and kind of the work that I've heard you talk about giving your students, if there's a way in which that that is actually the, you know, the thing itself, that is the, the project, yeah, the that, product. That's, that's a wonderful <laughs> correlation, Lily. I love it. Yeah, I did. I, you know, I, I, I think that, um, I think we like, we like to know that a lot is expected of us and needed of us and that something good comes from that if we rise to it. I think that we're built that way. And mm. um, I, I think that- I it, love that. I love it, that. We, we do, we rise to it. Yeah. We, we feel respected, we feel mm -hmm. important and needed and uh, that the farm that the centers lived on, um, that farm and that beautiful productive land was nothing without this family's work. And the family's work meant nothing if they did not have that land and that barn and those animals. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the, the level of satisfaction and the, the, profound, um, the profound fact of connection, of, of place and this family. And it was all work that, it was work that bound it all together. So, and yeah. yes, I, I think that uh, even writers 
uh, rise to that expectation that there is something inherently satisfactory, satisfying about um, working harder than we knew we could or would. Yeah. I think that's so true. Um, well, let me just make a little segue then with the, you're talking about the land, um, which I think is another, you know, deep, deep theme in the book, such a backbone, this idea of the, the land. And, and knowing that you spend your time in both uh, Maine, which makes mm -hmm. total sense, but also in California, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, like has moving back and forth between the coast Kind of like, were you doing that when you were writing? And if so, was that influencing how you were able to draft and, um, you know, talk about the land in this way? And then I have a follow up afterward, but okay, I great. will do one at a time. <laughs> Beneficence actually was written entirely in Maine. Um, I hmm. was able to organize my time uh, so that I was um, in my writing room in Maine. Uh, as I wrote that book, um, Maine is home for me. It has been my mm -hmm. entire life, uh, raised my family in Maine. And um, the, the place of Maine and the people of Maine and the stories of Maine are mine. That is, they are mine. Uh, I think that Berkeley is a wonderful place. I'm a stranger there. I visit mm -hmm. and uh, I, I love uh, the arts. I, attend a lot of music and dance and theater and um, my family, my family is there, my children are there. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to be, but I return home. I always speak about Maine as home. Yeah. Mm. So, so do you I can't, honestly, I can't imagine, I, I honestly wouldn't know how to locate a story mm. in Berkeley. And mm. even though the land of California has grabbed me. The, the North Bay, Northern California has grabbed me in a really powerful way, but I don't know what stories live there. I haven't been, I didn't grow up there. I didn't raise my family there. And I just don't know what that land holds. I don't understand it enough. And uh, I know what the apple tree orchard on the center farm, I know what it holds, so. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I guess that makes me curious if, um... Are you able to write in in Berkeley or are you just in Berkeley writing stories about Maine or like how does um, how does your writing routine travel from from coast to coast? Yes, I think that what happens in Berkeley, I generate I generate the work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if uh, my next book will be as deeply embedded in in Maine as Beneficence mm -hmm. is, and I think it will be. I, I, I think that that will be its world. Uh, but Berkeley is a wonderful place for me to draft shorter pieces and also to start building the ideas. Um, we'll see, you know, Beneficence has been in the world now since last October, and we'll see what happens if I am in, uh, in California and writing, whether Maine comes with me, or maybe I'll be surprised that something else mm -hmm. has happened. You never know what'll come knocking. You, know. you know that, Lily. You have yeah. no idea what might come. <laughs> so true. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the structure of the book. So you've kind of set it up in quarters uh, before, during, here. Nope, before, during, after, after here. Um, and those sections make so much sense. Um, they're so intuitive to the story. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask if that was a structure that you began with or something that you added later, you looked at the book and you're like, oh, this is, this is divided into four sections or how did you come to that decision? Um, no, it didn't come later. I, this is my first fiction. Um, I was an essayist and a, non a narrative nonfiction writer and came to fiction really, I'm a great reader. I have read all my life. I've read deeply and carefully and have read as a writer for most of my life. Um, but I came into this book really not knowing anything. I had never actually practiced it. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. And I sat down, all I knew was when I went into this story was that there was a man named Top 
He was part of a family, something awful happened to this family. And initially I believed that Tup was going to misbehave, uh, make very selfish decisions in order to rescue himself. And um, my, my interest before I ever sat down was, what does a guy like that think about? How, what does a guy mm. like that understand about the selfishness of his decisions? And um, I, I assumed Tuck was going to tell this story. I like a first person narrative. I knew that from my nonfiction work. And I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna let this guy talk and see what he has to say to us about how he can, how he can do harm to people and still go on. What does that look like? But when I sat down, actually it was Doris who opened the mm. first page and I had not planned on it at all. I had no, no concept of her, no understanding of their marriage, of her presence in Top's life, but she started speaking and it was really, really clear to me. She really introduces, she, when the book opens, it is Doris who presents the farm, this marriage and these children to us. And as soon as she started talking, I understood that she uh, is deeply in love with Top and likes him and respects him and trusts him. And so that sort of, that sort of um, bad guy that I imagined suddenly looked like a very thin and false character to me. And I, had, mm -hmm. I knew I had a lot of work to do and it was going to be Doris who taught me what I needed to know. Um, but from the beginning, I sat down, Doris opened. And then when Doris was done, I thought, well, I'd like another voice. Um, I don't want to just, I don't want this to be a dialogue between Doris and Top, Doris and Top. And I thought, Dodie, let's see what Dodie can add to this. And mm -hmm. so she stepped into the middle and added, uh, she had a lot to say. And um, then I understood in those early pages that I really was writing about um, a before time, you know, we all know these times, we all, yeah. we, when we've experienced great loss and grief, we, we clearly identify what happened, what came before, we know there is a line and what came before. So that actually became the before time. And then I started to understand that their process of moving through this tragedy was going to take them a long time. And I needed to move forward Chronologically, I made the decision it would be a clear chronology. And it, it does take place from the late 40s into the early 60s. And I realized that I could name those periods. That during time is a devastated time. The, the, um, the chapters, those spoken parts get shorter and shorter and uh, mm. they are, um, the stories go. There are, there's no storytelling, there's no remembering, there's no reminiscing. And then uh, slowly we come through this long drawn out after period that is um, the, the, the immediate devastation. I think this happens to us when, when we lose something, somebody, and uh, that long process of reorganizing ourselves and our sense of the world. And then finally here, when we come home again, we, these people did return to themselves and then to each other in that last section. So it was not a plan. I have no plan whatsoever when I sit down to write. And uh, it's because of that, um, for me, that's the joy of it. I can't imagine having a plan. I just, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be good at sticking to it. I know that. So <laughs> I used to joke when I was writing about top, I would joke with friends saying, you know, this guy refuses to do what I want him to do. He absolutely will not do what I'm telling him to do. And I loved that. I thought that was a pretty wonderful, it was quite a, quite a revelation to me that fiction is such a mysterious act that we are not, we do not control it. I've, uh, maybe some writers are able to do that. I certainly am not a writer who can control the story. It's, um, mm. It comes to me and comes onto the page. It quite literally tumbles onto the page and then I look and see that that's what's happening here. So it's a, a truly mysterious process to me. I love that. Um, well, it, I'm curious, you know, I, I'm thinking about Beston, um, the youngest son, and he doesn't have a voice in the book. And, um, but he, but, but we know him so intimately through these other gazes. Um, and he's so 
complex, even though we don't get to, to dwell inside his head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious whether you ever toyed with the idea of including him in the, in the narrators. You know, I made the decision not to because I honestly didn't trust myself with, he was only uh, five when the book opens mm -hmm. and I didn't trust myself with the voice of a child that young. I, for yeah. the child narrators that I like reading are have a kind of precocity. They are able to um, process the world um, beyond their years. And I'm, I'm interested in that. I, I want that as a reader. And I made the decision that Bestin would not have a voice. Dodie does a lot of translating for him. She really tells yeah. us who yeah. Bestin is and, um, and uh, what his needs are. She's very protective of him and really, in fact, spends a number of years mothering him when her own mother is not able to do that. Um, but I do, I have to say, Bestin stays with me too. He does not have a voice. And I wonder what would happen if I let Bestin start to tell his story. And maybe it's not this story. Maybe this story is part of his uh, growing up years and it's some other story that he has to tell. But I am curious about Bestin. <laughs> maybe we'll see him again. Yes, in maybe. Some other piece. Yes. Um, so I have, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to run out of time without asking you about your, uh, your writing routine, because that is always my favorite part of <laughs> these author Q and A's, just like getting, getting the details on what, um, whether you have a routine or don't, uh, what you, if there's anything you need next to you or with you to write. Um, as, and especially, you know, writing in, in two places, like what, what are the things that you, you bring with you um, when you're moving? You know, so I travel, I travel and write light. I have a laptop that travels with me at home in Maine. Um, I have a writing room that is small and uh, filled with books. And it's uh, also filled with light. It's a very nice room. It's a, just a... A welcoming room. I love that you call it a writing room. That's such a better term than an office. An office sounds yeah. like a bummer. A writing room yeah. sounds great. I do absolutely nothing happens in that room or at that desk except my creative writing. I don't ever uh, go online. I don't Google anything. If I need information, I leave that room and go out to the kitchen. And uh, I have a separate laptop that is not my writing laptop and go out to the kitchen oh and Google something that I need to know. But I never, ever do that in that writing space. That writing space is some other universe for me. And I do have an unusual writing pattern. I think I spend a great deal of time formulating these story, this, the book. It took me a great deal of time to formulate the concept of the book before I ever started writing it, a long time. And when I finally yeah. sat down to write it, it, uh, it was you know, a matter of a few months and it was written. I don't revise, I don't rearrange, I don't um, reconsider things, I don't know why, I just don't write that way. What comes onto the page, I'm constantly revising sentence to sentence and paragraph to paragraph. But beyond that, uh, when I close out my computer, I will in the morning open it, read back a few pages to get myself oriented and go forward. But I don't go back and rewrite sections or rearrange sections. And um, I also listen to Gregorian chants while I work and yes. it's been, it's quite <laughs> wonderful. I, uh, I found that I needed something beautiful uh, not just the silence of that writing space but also something that I didn't, couldn't actually follow. I couldn't he really hear it. And mm -hmm. so for years now, right, right back to uh, the writing of my memoir, when I sit down in that room, I put on my loop of Gregorian chants. They have played in the same order, a few hour long loop, and they play in the same order. I know it by heart. And when I flick that switch, when it goes on, it really is as if I am flicking a switch in my brain and I am gone. And um, I, I come back to this world late in the afternoon, hungry, click off those Gregorian chants and I'm done, I'm out of that world again. But those Gregorian chants really are my um, 
but there's somehow an entry point for me to a very, very profoundly interior and deep place that I write from. I love that routine so much. I really want <laughs> Not for everybody, I, Lily. <laughs> I want the link to your chance. I want to give it a try. It sounds um, really <laughs> meditative and kind of magical. I think it I think yeah. it, there's something to this. Um, Salem, hi. Did you wanna jump in with questions? Okay. Yes, indeed. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, also, thank you both so much for this delightful conversation. Lily, I love the questions that you've had for Meredith. They're really thoughtful and creative and different from a lot of other questions I've heard, um, which <laughs> I enjoy. Um, and Meredith, yeah, I loved hearing about your characters and process and world building. And I feel like we really got a glimpse um, into what that's like. And that's yeah, really beautiful and magical, as Lily said. Um, so this first question is from Meredith. Um, were there any books that you were reading while writing Beneficence? Or, um, you know, would love to hear about uh, any authors or books that were especially inspiring to you? So I'm one of those writers. I think this is true for many writers. I cannot read prose while I'm writing. I find it very... Um, it confuses me. I suddenly think, oh, I should be doing that, or why am I not doing this? And so I just, I leave prose alone entirely. I do like to read poetry. And um, so, and I always love to read nonfiction. It doesn't interfere with things. So I love to learn stuff. So I do read a lot of informative nonfiction. Um, but outside my writing, there are writers that I admire very, very much. Uh, William Faulkner is one of my great heroes. I do not understand how he so organically moves, um, moves in time and in depth of character simultaneously. It's really, for me, an awesome thing that he does and I have never figured it out. Uh, I like Kent Harris' work very much. Um, Marilyn Robinson, I admire enormously. Um, there are there's so many people, Virginia Woolf had one, when you know she was just very formative, it's uh, she's a formidable writer, and really, uh, I actually have a photograph of Virginia Woolf on my desk, and a black and white photograph, and she looks very. Uh, she, it's a very very somber uh, portrait of her, and um, it is a reminder to me to go all out, just go to the bottom, just do it all, and uh, so yeah. Thank you. Um, another question, um, how long did it take you to write this book um, from conception to publication? Um, and what, what was that process like for you? So once I actually sat down to write, this was true with my memoir too, I write quickly. I write day to day, it's a slow act. You know, it is literally sentence by sentence and paragraph by paragraph, I'm, I'm working at that level. Um, but, you know, I think beginning to end, once I, once I actually got started on the book, uh, for both my memoir and my novel, I would say probably in uh, five months for my memoir and six or seven months for my novel. Uh, but there's a lot of lead time. <laughs> there was a lot of thinking time leading up to that. Um, then uh, once it was, once I was done with it, it moved out into the world and um, a, a, a wonderful, brilliant editor, Josh Bodwell at Godin, uh, approached me about the book and um, asked if they could take it. And I had had a wonderful experience with Beacon Press with uh, my memoir and uh, often sort of preach to writers, trust the small independent presses. They will stick by you and be very loyal to you and your work. And I've had an extraordinary experience with Godin too. Um, and then they had the book, I think, you know, maybe it was supposed to come out in the spring of 2020 and it, it, COVID was exploding. We didn't, none of us had our feet under us. We didn't know what was going on and they delayed it to October but didn't want to delay it longer. So it came out a pretty rugged time uh, in October. And uh, now the paperback is coming out in a couple of weeks. So it, it made it and it's here, so. Thank you. Um, this next question is for both Meredith and Lily. Um, do you have any other projects that you're working on at the moment um, that you'd like to share with us? Lily, you take that. Um, 
I do have some projects that I'm working on. I think I, I, um, I go a little nutty without a couple of projects spinning at the same time. Um, I'm just wrapping up a book right now that I've been working on for many years. Um, and uh, it's my last month with it. So I'm trying to do all the things. Um, and, um, but I'm already thinking about the next one that I'm writing. So, um, oh, I guess I should describe. Uh, <laughs> uh, the book that I'm wrapping up is kind of a, a climate, crisis dystopia um, with a little twist of magical realism in it. Um, it's called The Light Pirate. I'm really excited about it. Meredith is reading it and we're gonna talk about it. I'm really excited. <laughs> I, will, I will interject. Um, Lily's sense of uh, imagination and her powerful ability to tell uh, actually short stories, story after story, she has an extraordinary ability to convey a world and the world she's put, she's placed these characters in is a world none of us, you know, we might dread it, we might worry about it, but none of us have actually described it. And Lily is describing that world and then periodically uh, somehow rescuing us from this, <laughs> with, this with this extraordinary, these, these flashes of light, just flashes of light of magic realism. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book. You're gonna make me blush, Meredith. Thank you, you very much. It. You deserve it. Well, what are you working on, Madame? Well, we talked about Beston and Beston is really holding mm -hmm. my attention. This youngest child is really holding my attention. Uh, when, you know, in that, in that sort of lag time after your publisher takes your book and then it comes out, there's a, nothing really is going on. You know, it's done and there's not a lot going on. And during that time, I started a novel that is holding my interest, and I may return to that. Um, it's actually, I started thinking about it, uh, about um, imagining my mother's generation. Um, I had a relatively fraught relationship with my mother, but I have enough compassion to understand that she came, she was born in 1920, and she tried to come into the world as an extremely free thinking, but uneducated and poor woman. And she suffered for that. She tried on lots of different costumes as she tried to fit norms and they were not, they were not successful and not healthy for her. And I've been thinking about how many women before us, how lucky I am to be living in this time when I, um, we have a lot of work to do and, and miles and miles to go, but I am in charge of my life. And my mother was not in charge of her life. So I'm, I've started this novel, um, maybe uh, 80 pages into imagining a woman like my mother as she, um, as she takes on the first of those costumes and tries to make it fit. So I, and, and now I've been so deeply back inside Beneficence with all these events around the hardcover and now the paperback that Bestin is very present for me again. So we'll see. Well, thank you both so much. Those both sound like really beautiful and um, important projects and we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for them. Um, Meredith, it was such a treat to hear you read a passage from the book at the beginning of this conversation. Um, you have such a wonderful sense of imagery and atmosphere, and I think that it makes a lot of sense that you read poetry while you're writing, because yeah. your work does feel very poetic. Um, Thank you, Sam. I was wondering if you might read another passage for us. I actually would love to do that. Thank you. This is, um, this is a section uh, told by Top. This is much later in the book. Um, you will hear from this where Top and Doris are now. They have spent a number of years living very separate lives. Doris has been inside her own um, despair, her own grief, and Top has actually uh, strayed outside this family seeking some kind of uh, comfort. And um, in this scene, uh, Dodie is actually getting married to an old, old friend and a young boy who had been uh, very much, a, 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 he was around the farm and the, these children from the time they were little, he was there a lot. Um, so, uh, and that man's name is Daniel. I think that that's all you, you need to know. I think you can follow this. 
Doris moved to Dodie's side as Daniel walked across the yard toward his bride and Doris reached for her daughter's hand and Dodie did not balk, which I would have understood, but she did not. And they stood side by side, mother and daughter, holding hands until Daniel came beside her and then it was his hand she held and Doris moved to my side. I will remember the soft summer air and warm sun with its deep palliative shadows, the cows at a distance in the west pasture on the heavy green grass and Dodie beautiful in her white dress. I will remember Daniel's fullness with happiness and Dodie's and Beston's music coming over the yard with its free and unbounded promise. Mostly I will remember my wife coming into the world, reaching for her daughter and spending love. Doris's hair has grayed, but still in the brightness of the summer sun, it shone golden down her back. We stood side by side, and then I gave our daughter over into marriage. Afterward, we ate in the cool shade of the porch, Marion staying, Dodie's friend, Marion staying, and Beston continuing with his music from the front room, the piano, and his low, soft voice apart from us. Doris had risen to the occasion and made quite a feast of salads and breads and a big sheet of cake, and she served each of us carefully, the table covered with the white cloth she used, she used to bring out on holidays. Dodie had washed and ironed and rehemmed her mother's good blue dress, and she had pinned a white rose at her shoulder. Doris looked beautiful, the wear of these seven years gone on this day of ceremony. I have not seen my wife relieved of her grief in all this time. I felt the day of our own marriage powerfully and moved through the afternoon belonging in both times, my wife and my daughter each on their wedding days, an alleviation of my own encumbrances. After lunch, Dodie and Daniel walked to the creek, a sort of honeymoon afternoon. Doris and I sat together under the elms, watching them move away and settle in the distance. Did they remind you of us? I asked her. Yes, she said. Our love endures, Doris, I said. My wife was quiet. Then she moved her foot next to mine, pressing. The house and the barn and the fields were all in order. Our three children all here on this land and now Daniel joining us. The great trees rose above us in all their power and protection the garden at its peak, promising plenty, my wife's leg pressing mine. We stayed together for the afternoon, Doris accepting stories I wanted to tell, remembrances. After supper, we all sat on the porch, the table back against the wall, and Dodie and Daniel sharing the old glider. We read, interrupting each other to share something of interest and sometimes laughing together. Doris sat with us on the porch, her knitting needles surprising us with the click of their old rhythm. Baston stepped outside for his cigarette and returned with a firefly glowing in his cupped hand. And after he released it, he read to us some poems he likes by Langston Hughes, poems he said have music in them. Doris was attentive. Dodie and Daniel rose finally, and we all said a very cheerful and teasing good night, and they went upstairs. Later, Doris put aside her knitting and we all got up. I watched Doris follow Beston up the stairs and she put out the light at the top, turning back to look at me for a moment as the dark fell. I checked the barn and the door to the coop in case Dodie had forgotten in her excitement to close up her hands. I stood uncertain, the new moon lighting the house and the yard and the silent fields and the great white wall of the barn. And then I walked in the, in the dark through the shed and then the kitchen and then the hall and then the front room where I settled for the night on the sofa. Thank you so much for that absolutely beautiful passage. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the last minute or so that we have here, um, do either of you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with? Hmm. Lily. Pick up a copy of Beneficence. It's probably the best book you're going to read this year. I, I mean, don't take it from me. Richard Powers, uh, or sorry, Richard Russo says that uh, we need to invent the word luminous if it didn't already exist to describe Meredith's prose. So 
Great. Wonderful, Lily. And please, please go to Lily's book, uh, Good Morning Midnight. And then uh, can I share the title of the, the book that you're working on now? Sure, yeah, yeah. A title that I absolutely love, The Light Pirates. I think it's mm -hmm. a, just a stunning title. So, and, you, and please, if you're here with us, uh, turn to Weller's books and order your books through them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Salem. Yeah, thank, thank you both so thank much. You, Salem. Thank beautiful. you, Weller's books. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. You both have a fantastic night. Thank you. Thanks.